right. Good, Good evening, everyone. People hear me all right? No? No. I think so. I'll have to speak louder. Okay. Can people hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, good evening. My name is uh, Nate Twitchell. I'm the executive director of the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. Wanted to thank everyone for coming out on now. I was, you know, just going to say thanks for coming out, but on this snowy evening, even more so. A little bonus snow is what my wife and I always call storms like this. Um, we are here tonight to do our first community event for 5B Resilient, which is the newest program of the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. Um, I want to thank uh, my team and our panelists for coming tonight to uh, put in the hard work to have a discussion around uh, water. We're calling it Water 101, a starting point for all of us uh, that need to know more or those of us that know a ton and want to learn more about the conversation on water. <coughs> Additionally, uh, I want to thank and call out the leadership and hard work of uh, Amy Mateus and Hannah Harris. Uh, they're the brains and the brawn behind this uh, operation tonight and um, their thought leadership uh, really put into works this new sort of community initiative and program that we have. So thank you both very much. Uh, the vision behind 5B Resilient uh, is that many of us are looking for opportunities to take climate action in our days, you know, in our daily lives, um, but we're looking for ways and opportunities to participate in the conversation and make meaningful action and change. Uh, and we're hoping that events like this can be a point for further education and understanding um, and that th the community series tonight will aim to look at water rights, water use, water storage, and water quality, putting those on the table in a candid conversation with the hopes that all of us can better understand the topic and ha be informed community members around the conversation. And that's really the goal in the long run for us, is to enhance that across a series of topics. <clears throat> so we hope to have future events uh, as community resources, and we'll also have an online set of resources that'll be building over time to educate yourself on a myriad of things from water rights and how to do conservation and catchment in your own home to things along the lines of energy conservation, uh, regenerative uh, landscaping opportunities for your home, and food preservation, just to name a few. All these topics will be seasonally relevant for either the season that's on hand or the season that's yet to come, and we hope that you'll join us in exploring these topics over time through our new program. So thank you all again for coming, and I'll leave it to Hannah and the panelists to take it away tonight. Have a good evening. Yeah, there you go. All right, I'm going to hand that over to you guys. Um, well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening, especially, again, given the weather. Um, for folks who are watching later, we appreciate you um, coming back and, and viewing this video to learn all about water. Um, so to give you an overview of the evening, I'm going to ask each panelist a set of questions that they're going to answer specifically. And then after that, there will be several questions that are open to both panelists to answer that are more discussion-based and action-based. And then there will be time for audience questions at the end. So if you think of a question mid-panel, um, please tuck it away or write it down so that you remember for the very end. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we were planning on having a third panelist, so big thank you to Justin Stevenson, who is planning on being here this evening. Um, he's under the weather, so he's staying home to protect us all and keep us healthy. So thank you to Justin. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we are certainly not the only organization doing water conservation work in the Valley. We're definitely not alone in this, um, in this work and in this effort. Uh, there are a lot of other wonderful organizations out there doing this work. So 5B Can, Climate Action Coalition, Wood River Land Trust, um, the Wood River Water uh, Coalition, and then also Nature Conservancy. So um, some of those folks are in the room tonight, and thank you for your expertise and your work as well. Um, so to kind of give an overview of the state of water in Idaho, um, I'm not sure if folks have been following what's happening with the Colorado River Reservoir, um, but there is a lot of concern over what that looks like in the future. Um, we are not as impacted by that here in Idaho. 
but over 800,000 Idahoans are impacted by drought. And there are 30 counties in Idaho that are designated as disaster drought areas by USDA. So those statistics can feel really overwhelming. Um, and again, as Nate mentioned, our goal is to um, hopefully impart in all of you through this panel um, hope and inspiration that everyday climate action um, doesn't have to be super complicated and that our collaborative efforts really do make a difference. Um, so I'm going to get my notes out because our panelists have a lot of really wonderful titles, so I had to write them down. Um, so I'll give a brief intro and then I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves a little bit further. Um, but with us this evening, we have Dr. Wendy Pavich, who is the founder of Water Futures, and she is also the author of Taking on Water. She has her PhD in water resources from MIT. We also have Chris Johnson with us this evening. Um, he is the EPA program manager for the Idaho Rural Water Association. Um, he's also an alderman for the city of Bellevue and a board member of Blaine County Soil and Water Conservation District. So, Wendy, if you'd like to give us a brief introduction into more of your work and yourself, that would be lovely. Um, well, I know a lot of you in this room. I've worked on this. Oh, I'm sorry. I know a lot of you in this room, and I've worked on water issues for the 20 years that I've lived here, and that ranges everything from this book that we're going to talk about, which is about um, reducing your water footprint, to water rights, to... I, um, running the land and water conservation, I mean the land and water, land, water and wildlife fund for the county, or I'm helping administrator that. And um, yeah, and my art and my painting and my writing is all about water often too, so. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well thanks for everybody showing up and allowing me to be here. Um, I don't have quite the resume that, uh, MIT, I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> actually, a little scared now. <laughs> um, no, um, so let's see. I came, I came back to Idaho. I grew up up in North Idaho. I came back to Idaho in 2015. I started working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, doing irrigation projects, working with a lot of you on different, uh, um, you know, fire projects, resource projects, and then uh, an opportunity came along with Idaho Rural Water. They're a nonprofit out of Boise that provides training and technical assistance around the state to our public water systems and our wastewater systems. And I started there as a source water specialist and um, just helping cities develop source water protection plans. So you identify where your, your point source of water is and then um, areas of impact that, that could be affected, that could affect the water there. And after about two years of doing that, um, this program opened up and we're expanding the EPA program quite a bit and it just gives me a lot more chance to see the whole state. I'm still doing technical training. I still do a lot of emergency response plans. I can do a source water plan and stuff, but it gives me a lot more diversity and I, I, it doesn't pigeonhole me as much. But we've just expanded that program a bit to allow, we just got a grant, to, it's a very small grant, but um, EPA funded us. Um, to start working on private well systems too. So getting education out there for private well owners, just to tell them how to do their assessments, uh, what type of maintenance they should be doing, and you know, uh, give them awareness of uh, potential hazards in, in the area, so like nitrate priority areas, or if it's high arsenic levels, just let them know that it's in their region and they may want to test for it now and again, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we're actually going to start our first set of questions with Chris, so Wendy, if you wouldn't mind <laughs> passing the microphone back, thank you so much. Um, so our first question for Chris this evening, who's going to be discussing um, generally, kind of thematically, water quality treatment in our ecosystems and our homes in the valley. So our first question for you this evening is, what do wo local water treatment processes look like? So how do we treat our water um, here in the valley? Yeah, so typically there's about four different types of uh, processes. Um, they just start with uh, what we basically do here in the valley is chlorination. and we don't. We've only started doing that recently and we haven't even really had to do it. With our well systems that we use for the cities and even the spring systems, there hasn't been a lot of hits for um, E. coli or any other bacteria. So the well water comes out very clean. We haven't needed to treat it, but just as a safety precaution and as DEQ increases the regulations, um, both Bellevue and Haley have just uh, put in um, liquid chlorine pumping systems into their wells. Um, the, the Bellevue well system, or spring system, it uses some chlorine pucks that the water runs off of or runs through. Um, but like I said, there, unless there's a high flood event or something that actually can contaminate the well, we haven't had too many issues. 
Um, some of the smaller systems, private well systems, you might see some reverse, osmo reverse osmosis units. Um, but in general, especially in this valley, uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of treatment needed. Um, but as we are getting more and more influence, some from the fires and just other things, just to, to up our protection levels, um, chlorine disinfection is our primary treatment method right now. Thank you. Um, and how are we doing as a community maintaining a high level of water quality for ecosystems specifically? Um, and then who plays a role in maintaining that? I'll address the second half of that. I think we all play a role in it. Um, mm -hmm. and it given our different industries, our different professions, and how we interact with our communities and our water systems, we each have a role to play. Uh, for the most part, um, you know, get to my notes on that page. Um, and as a community as a whole, I think we're headed in the right direction. So far, um, in the last three years, Bellevue has adopted a source water protection plan. Uh, Cary has adopted a source water protection plan. Haley is just finalizing their source water protection plan. Sun Valley uh, Water and Sewer District have their source water, and it's been approved by DEQ. And even Ketchum, they have an older, what's called a uh, well protection, wellhead protection plan, but they are in the process of looking at updating it to a full source water plan. So we are looking at it community-wide, um, but then also all the resources that we're looking at, how to, how to protect our river. We're getting more uh, riparian areas put in and just stream bank protection. We're getting away from the riprap and going to more natural courses. So as a whole, throughout the valley, um, and then through the county, um, I think we're looking pretty good. And for anyone who doesn't know, could you explain briefly what a riparian area is? More about that part. So you got, <laughs> um, you basically, I would look at it, it's the, you've got your mainstream flows and then you've got your, your um, stream banks and then where the water would typically overflow in, at certain peak times um, and also spread out through the, the main channel um, up into your high water point or your maximum um, overflow point. So it, it provides a lot of habitat for um, your beavers, uh, just all sorts of critters, um, uh, spring flows for, for um, some, uh, what would you call it, uh, fish uh, population growth. <laughs> um, Spawning. Spawning, thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a very crucial area um, for duck habitat, fish habitat, the wildlife habitat um, gets overlooked. And we've, uh, some of our practices in the past, um, uh, sometimes grazing has over, overrun it, sometimes mm -hmm. just the way we built our homes and use the rip rabbit, it just blows it out because you gain all that energy. And so looking at, we can look at it as a holistic process to um, treat it and, and keep those riparian areas and let them do their work and we'll actually reduce the long-term uh, high flood issues. So. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then our last specific question for you this evening is what federal programs are available to ensure water quality into the future? Um, so primarily through our federal programs, we look at EPA. Um, the EPA works uh, directly with the uh, Department of Environmental Quality here in Idaho. So uh, I, the state of Idaho, DEQ, actually has primacy over our water and our wastewater systems. But EPA is the one that set down the regulations to begin with. We begin with um, the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974, that one really established um, some testing principles and started looking at point source collection and identifying how we make sure that we have clean public health uh, drinking water. Uh, the second one, it regulates on the wastewater side and that's the Clean Water Act. Um, it controls point pollution, so from our effluent, whether we land at it or if it gets uh, put back into uh, the river, um, we look at things that how that water that comes out of our wastewater treatment plants after it's been fully treated, um, how do they regulate that to make sure it can be used in a proper way. And we're coming up with some really good innovations for reuse water. Um, even Boise, there's a treatment plant over there, they were able to get it to a high, high enough quality to uh, first apply to, to parks and playgrounds, and now they're actually brewing beer with some of their water. So. Um, besides those two organizations, DEQ and EPA, we have uh, uh, through USDA, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they've established quite a few programs with uh, watershed protection, and now they've got the National Water Quality Initiative, and they've also got um, their own source water protection plan. So they're getting really innovative in what they're doing, and instead of just worrying about uh, lagoon runoff from, uh, say, your, your cattle and uh, your dairy operations, you know, how can we do a holistic approach, get into the watershed where our sources start, where it affects everybody downstream, and start rebuilding those fire habitats and and everything that's, that we need to look at to improve the stream banks and the water condition coming off the mountains, coming off the melt off into the streams and into our lakes and rivers. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
if you wouldn't mind please passing the mic to Wendy. So um, as I mentioned, Wendy wrote a really wonderful book. Um, it's currently not available at the library in Ketchum because I have it, but I will return it soon. Um, it's called Taking on Water, and um, she went through a really incredible journey in terms of um, formal education and academia and also experiencing water culturally around the world. Um, so a big part of her book is also measuring water footprint. Um, and so Wendy, our first question for you this evening is in your book you discuss water footprints and ways we all use water indirectly. Um, so ways that we might not be aware that we're using water in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, could you please start by explaining what goes into calculating a water footprint for an individual? Sure, so a water footprint is essentially um, a summation of all the water that's used directly and indirectly in, um, and there's three categories. It's um, green, wa green water, which is essentially rainwater that comes into production, production process or, um, you know, to grow plants, for instance. Blue water, which is irrigation water from surface and groundwater. And then gray water, which is the um, resulting pollution from any kind of a um, process. And so you can actually, and there are algorithms, you know, there are, there are organizations, there's an organization called the Water Footprint Network in the Netherlands that kind of originated a lot of this. And they have done extensive studies. They have a whole methodology, but basically to evaluate the water footprint of all sorts of products and processes. And, um, and so you can evaluate your water footprint as an individual, but you can also do it for a neighborhood or a community or a company or a nation. And so it's a really um, interesting, well, I'll ask, how many of you knew what a water footprint is? So I'm gonna just tell you a couple of fun facts. So uh, in the United States, the average consumer uses like 100 gallons per person per day in their homes. That's about you know, something over 30,000 gallons a year. Um, and in a place like Idaho, where we have, um, you know, we're high alpine desert, mm -hmm. and we do a lot of irrigating in the summers in particular, our footprint is much higher than the average. Mm -hmm. our, our direct water use is much higher than the average because generally because of summer irrigation. Um, so, the reason I wrote this book, actually, was because I had, when I first moved here, um, I had a series of hoses around my yard to water here and there, and I kept leaving, and I kept going to, I went to Alaska for the summer, and I, I would come back, and my yard was just a disaster. So I had the bright idea, like, oh, I think I'll, I should get an irrigation system. And I'm from the East Coast originally, where you don't have to water anything. So, which is kind of the story around here, right? So, anyway, so I take off for the summer and I come back and I get my water bill, which, you know, it, it didn't cost much, which is also mm -hmm. a ridiculous fact, but I discovered that I was absolutely horrified to understand I had used 30,000 gallons in the month of August to irrigate my postage stamp lawn in Old Haley. Mm -hmm. So that was the sort of impetus for this book. I started like looking. So, so you're horrified about how much direct water you use, but then when you start digging into your water footprint, the average U.S. consumer, just I'm going to ask, does anybody have a guess what your average annual water footprint would be? 50,000? 750,000 gallons per person per year. We, are the, we have the largest water footprints in the world, of course, just it parallels all the other footprints, right? Carbon, nitrogen. Um, and so that is all these unseen ways we use water, all the products and services. And the primary drivers are, um, well, Agriculture takes about 70 to 80 percent of the globe's water supply or the, the water consumption. And so it's our food and fiber primarily. Mm -hmm. So clothing and food. And um, anyway, so yeah, so it's sort of astounding and there's, it's, um, it's complicated and um, I can say more, but I'll wait for your next question maybe. Well, the next question is actually kind of ties into that 
which is what was the most um, surprising thing that you discovered in calculating your own water footprint? Well, I just discovered, so my water, I went back and looked at the numbers. My water footprint it was about half of what um, an average consumer um, is, has as a water footprint. And that's primarily because I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, and I also, you know, have a small house and I try to reduce, reuse, recycle all these things. But still, it's, it's still hor sort of horrifying, right? But actually the most surprising, when I, I had a pie, I have a little pie chart, was my dog's food. As a meat eater, she had like, you know, a quarter of the footprint that we did. Like half of our footprint was food. Yes. And then, mm -hmm. you know, my dog had another. I was like, whoa, she's like, she's not that big. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she likes to eat, but, yeah. you, know, you know. Yeah, So That's that like, was one of the yeah, most surprising. Yeah, pets is something ones. that I did not think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Um, and then our third question for you this evening is, what is one thing, kind of shifting gears here, um, what is one thing you wish our local political leaders would do to address our limited water resources here? Well, I've been, actually, I have an answer to that because I've been hammering on this for a while and more directly recently because I'm part of that, um, the, um, the climate action stuff for the county, mm -hmm. the task force on land and water. And I really think that one of the critical steps here is to get a, a really solid handle on our water budget. So to come up with and, and we've done this. I, I helped start the USGS study. If any of you are familiar about of this USGS study, it was a $750,000 study funded half by the USGS and half by this community. And we started, I started it with Bruce Liam and um, Lee, Lee Brown when I first moved here because we understood pretty quickly that there's not that much, there was not that much data here, which was mm -hmm. shocking coming from the East Coast. Like, what do you mean there's not enough data to calibrate these models? Like, what? But there, there wasn't. And so that study, though, is a five-part study, and one of the phases did a water, a, a budget, groundwater budget for the whole aquifer. So looking at the inputs mm -hmm. and the outputs and, you know, sort of all the different sources and the ways it's used. And that's a really great starting point to understand, to evaluate what I think we need to do the next steps is evaluate what the sustainable yield of that aquifer is in our whole water system, and then start building plans and policies to, to you know, reach a goal. Because right now, we're not doing that at all. Yeah. And it's like uh, out of sight, out of mind. And we're all pretending that it's not happening and that the groundwater's not suffering, which it is. Yes. And so that would be my pitch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're going to move on to questions that are a little bit more general um, for both or either of you to answer. Um, and so the first question is, what are some innovations or new practices um, you're excited about happening in the next 10 years around water? <laughs> I, I talked a little bit about it already, but um, what we're doing with our wastewater reuse, I think is uh, we're seeing a lot of good ways we can actually reuse that water, reclaim it, put it in a, into a beneficial use. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of improvements on uh, variable rate drives and pumps uh, that'll increase uh, um, energy efficiency and reduce our energy cost. Um, at our water wastewater plants and one of the things I'm really um, fascinated with right now are uh, drones that we're able to identify mm -hmm. and we're able to use remote sensing to identify where we have leaks in our water systems and other uh, potential uses um, along those lines with the drones. So. Um, I, I actually, you know, there's, there's all sorts of technology out there and there's mm -hmm. been all sorts of top technology out there and we have the answers to most of these questions. And so my, you know, really where it needs to come is the political action. And it needs to come from all of you, you know? Like, we need to back the right politicians who have the political will to do the right things. Because if that doesn't happen, none of this is changing. It doesn't really, you know, you need the right policies in place. And actually, um, I'll just give an example, then this comes from the water footprint thing. One of the things, when I, I did a, a speaking tour when, I, when this book came out. And one of the things I talked about was there was this study done by a professor at the University of Arizona. 
and he did this piece in the Wall Street Journal that like completely blew me away. And it was about the idea that um, they had looked at um, the, let's see, what was it? It was, they were growing um, alfalfa. They had, mm -hmm. they had the data for the um, alfalfa growth or acreage in the California part of the, Cal of the Colorado River watershed. And over 10 years, they tracked that the alfalfa production or the, the land in alfalfa production had grown like 10 times. Mm -hmm. And he started to unravel this and started to understand that what was happening was it so if you, th you know, we all know about the Colorado River system, right? This is entirely, hugely subsidized, hugely expensive. Like there's, you know, all the energy and the, you know, the dams and the delivery systems and the fighting over water rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, like all of it, like there's, I don't even, you, I can't even imagine really what the bill on this whole thing is. Um, and so what was happening was the farmers in California were using, they're using subsidized water delivery, growing alfalfa to satisfy the meat and milk demand in China to grow beef in China. And this was also because there were container ships coming into, you know, um, in Southern California bringing plastic from China and going back empty. So mm -hmm. we were sending either our recycling or whatever, or you're sending alfalfa mm -hmm. to feed their cows. And when you look at that, like from the 30,000 foot view, you're like, wait a second, so as a taxpayer, I am paying to subsidize the export of our Colorado River water to China. Like what is wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, you know, that's world economic forces, that's mm -hmm. politics, but, you know, it, why we don't have a, a national water policy is beyond me. And I know, like, obviously there's a lot of impediments to that, right, because we have state water law, which mm -hmm. is another massive issue. There, you know, um, we didn't follow John Wesley Powell and, you know, designing our states around watersheds. Um, but anyway, so I think the political thing is, is a more important question than the technology at this point. Yeah, thank you. Um, our next question is, what is one water-related topic you think uh, that people in the Wood River Valley should take the time to learn about? If you had to pick one. Maybe their own water use. Good answer. And, and maybe that's both direct and indirect. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, beyond you just uh, the commercial use and our individual home uses, um, just what's out in our environment right now, what we're looking at when we recreate. And I was going to say uh, the harmful algal blooms are, are a big topic right now that we're looking at and how in the future we're going to treat those. We don't have to worry about that as much here in the valley since we're not pulling surface water where they're affected. But just to be aware of them when you are out recreating, um, I think Mormon Reservoir, a couple years ago, they had some blooms show up. It's really prevalent uh, in late summer up in Cascade, up above McCall or down below McCall. Um, so just be aware of it. Um, it can affect, uh, it has killed people in the last couple of years. There have been uh, um, people out hiking, um, pulling out water off a creek or something that does have it, um, have, have, have been killed. And it also can uh, hurt your dogs when you're out walking them. And just be able to identify it and you'll just see, um, you know, the blooms will occur in, for, in any type of water. Um, it'll show up like foam, scum. Uh, there'll be some mats on the surface and it'll just be different colors. So when you start seeing water that you, you wouldn't want to drink or you wouldn't want your dog to drink, try to keep them out of it as best you can. Thank you, that's really important. Um, I know people who have personally been affected by that, so that is definitely something to be aware of. Is that here? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, our last question um, before we get into audience questions is um, what is one way you would like to invite audience members to contribute to water resiliency in our valley? So this is more of an action-based question versus a knowledge-gaining question. <laughs> I'm going to steal this one before Wendy does. And she's, she's already brought this up a couple times, but uh, the, the average American family uses more than 3, 000, or 300 gallons of water daily, and 70% of that occurs indoor. Um, the largest use of household water is going to be to flush your toilets, um, and by following, uh, followed that by showers and baths. 
but toilets account for nearly 30% of average home indoor water consumption. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say, just address your leaks. Um, we have tablets where you can just put in some food coloring in the back of that tank, and if it shows down your bowl, you might have a leak in there. And just address those. Uh, if you're paying for water, uh, I mean, Bellevue, we're, we're on a flat rate system, so it didn't really matter to me. But when you hear it leaking and you make a fix to it, um, I, I feel like I'm doing something better by addressing those leaks. And um, that's what I would encourage people to do. Is, I mean, just start where you can fix things at your own house. Um, reduce the what you can in your sprinkler systems. Look at how many minutes your, your timers are running for and the, day, the time of day you're running your sprinkler systems and try to go for those late evening, overnight, and shut it off by, you know, 8 in the morning. Um, and just do what you can do around your house. I would add that a leaking toilet can lose 10,000 gallons a year. So that is a big one. Um, you might want to like investigate your water footprint because in w where you're consuming things that are you know high water value, because it's um it's a bigger topic. And we, you know, the other thing that's really kind of wild about it is we have a global trade in water, in mm -hmm. embedded water, and so that looks like. Um, economies that are wealthy and water scarce can actually outsource all the problems and that's you know we're we're really good at doing that right like we're buying you know denim from a, like a pair of blue jeans takes 2200 gallons of water to and is primarily to grow the, grow the cotton and you know that's happening in India where their aquifers are being depleted mm -hmm. and farmers are committing suicide because they don't have they can't, can no longer irrigate and feed their families and all these things. And so, you know, as the, some of the biggest consumers on the planet, we have a big role in all of that. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. So reduce, reuse, recycle. Yeah. Um, are there any audience questions at this point in time? Yes, and I will also say that um, because we're recording this, um, I'll invite you to ask your question and then I'm going to repeat it just so we know that it's been recorded and people know what was asked. Um, I think it would be really helpful to a lot of people, especially in the water footprint. I picked up a phone file 10 years ago. I don't even know who wrote it. Um, and it talked about diets and those kind of things. But if you could provide for the public resources places they can go and educate themselves, I think that would be very useful because I was shocked. It changed my diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question was about um, discovering your water footprint and making resources about water footprints more publicly available. Um, so I would invite everyone to read Wendy's book. Um, but if you wouldn't mind mentioning again the, I think it was a website that you were referring to or a Norwegian study. Yeah, there's the Water Footprint Network in the Netherlands. But you know, now there's a, now there's a number of water footprint calculators. Like you mm -hmm. can just go Google it. I don't even know how many there are at this point, but National Geographic has one. Um, there's a number of them. And it, it, it's sort of fun to play around. You'll be surprised at like, you know, what your choices mean. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. My question is about water rights. Mm -hmm. uh, when I moved here, I was shocked to find out that you know some people can splurge on using water, while others who are trying to grow food mm -hmm. had to sell their farms because they had no water to finish their crops and went backward. So, um, what's What's the justice and water rights? What what good are water rights doing? And and what are we? What can we transform this water rights system into something that is more water justified? Yeah. So um, Mino's question was about water rights and kind of the origin of how water rights came to be um, first in time, first in right. If people are familiar with that word or that phrase. So um, the current water rights system is. Um, functions kind of under priority dates. Um, and your question was about, is there a more um, justice-oriented or use-oriented way that those could be restructured? So that's a big question. Um, and I'll let you two think and discuss on that. 
Well, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, it's just like it's a ar very archaic system, but it's we're embedded in it, so it's really challenging. Um, there are there have been some efforts in other states, like Vermont, I think, a number of years ago, um, re sort of restated that the water in Vermont belonged to the people of Vermont. And in Idaho, it belongs to the people too, but essentially a water right is now transacted as if it's a property right. But in fact, it's a, it's a use of fructory right, is what they call it, which means it's a right to use the water. It is not, does not mean you own the water. But in fact, when we you know, transact property and water rights, we transact them as if they're property rights, sort of in practice. So um, yeah, it's a, that's a, very challenging question you ask because it's a, it's, it's not functioning well. Anything to add? No, I mean, we're trying to do as best we can, um, looking at different options, and we've had different groups meet over the last several years. And the last three years, the Big Wood Groundwater Management Plan have been trying to address um, specifically this: how do you, how do you define the beneficial use and uh, you know distribute the water so ranchers and farmers can make their crops, the municipalities can provide the water for you know s all this growth that's happening, and it all comes down to money. Um, who has the most money to fight for the most water they want? That's the unfortunate thing right now. But um, they're having good discussions. I think we are making progress in, in being more equitable in what we're doing with our water shares. And um, unfortunately, it's come at the cost of uh, millions of dollars of litigation. So. Water runs on hell to money. Right <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes. So um, you're talking about treating water. And I wondered about, like, when we're using our, our water in the kitchen, because I try not to waste so is it, you know, goes down the drain and then you guys treat it? Does it go back in the river or do you use it for? So each, each system is a little different. Um, oh, repeat the question. Yes, so the question, no, that's okay. So the question was um, when you use water in your home and the water comes out of the tap and it's been treated for you to use in your kitchen, it's potable, which means it's safe to drink. Um, you try not to waste the water that comes out of your kitchen sink, but inevitably some of it goes down the drain um, and then gets treated. So how do we ensure that treated water is not harming ecosystems as it goes back into the ecosystem? All right. So the water that comes in that's been treated from the wells and the spring systems, you use it for your home. Um, when it goes back in, it's, a, it, it's in a collection system that goes to a water treatment plant or water uh, system lagoons. Those are monitored by uh, DQ and they have um, uh, permits that say this is how you can do it and they have to, they, they have their plants evaluated every about every five years. Um, we have to check the uh, treatment ponds for seepage um, and they do seepage testing every five to ten years um, and things like that but it really comes down to most of the treated effluent, that's what we'll call it, is the water going out of the treatment plant. Um, we can either land apply it, so uh, through Bellevue we have uh, two fields that we have agreements with that we land up and it has to be for a secondary use, so it's not for a primary consumption for human, but it can be for alfalfa that can go through a cow and then we can eat the cow. Um, and then uh, both Haley and uh, Ketchum and Sun Valley Water and Sewer, uh, they put their water to a high enough quality that it goes back into the big wood. And those, those numbers, um, so we have, so I would say like uh, Kendrick and, and Julieta are in the Clearwater Basin. Um, they're five miles away from each other. Kendrick's north of them. They use a pond system and they put their effluent back into the potlatch, which five miles down the road, river, uh, Julieta pulls the drinking water out of that river, has to go through another treatment process, and they drink it, and then it goes through a, a membrane plant so they can put it back into the river. Uh, it's common through the Snake River to have these same type of systems where, you know, cities start here, you're drinking somebody's effluent at some point, but between dilution processes and the permitting requirements, and it gets tested at such a, I mean, they're testing it every day on the chemical properties, what's going in. Um, but you know, Ketchum had a display up where they had a fish tank, and those fish were just, were, they were thriving for the last three or four years. So. That's a great question. Thank you for your answer. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I think we probably don't have a huge issue here, but nationally, 
you know, despite mm -hmm. all these standards, like, you know, for instance, nitrate in, in wastewater, which is what I studied in my, in grad school, was looking at um, denitrification, which is the only way you can renew, remove nitrate in groundwater. Um, you know, we don't, to, to actually remove nitrate from a wastewater stream, which happens to be one of the limiting nutrients in, in coastal zones, it's the mm -hmm. limiting nutrient to primary product productivity. And in freshwater systems, it's often phosphorus, but phosphorus and nitrogen. So that's when you see, when you have a harmful algal bloom, for instance, that's driven by nutrients. So fertilizers, we need to stop that also, <laughs> you, know, you know, on our lawns. Um, but so, you know, nitrate makes it into the wastewater systems and oftentimes it's not treated because it's super, to add a denitrifying system mm -hmm. is extremely expensive. And so there's some places they do it, other places they don't. So that's one problem. There's also all these, you know, estrogen mimicking compounds, mm -hmm. um, pharmaceuticals, you know, all sorts of stuff that's not even tested. You know, so they call them emerging contaminants, you know, and we're always discovering new ones. And so all that stuff's still there, too. Mm -hmm. um, the city of Ashton um, over on the east side is a good example of where they're in a high nitrate priority area. Um, they're pulling out water from the ground and it's testing at above 14 to 15 uh, parts per million with nitrate. And you want to stay for, for drinking water, um, anything over 10 is excessive. Uh, the, the MCL minimum maximum contaminant level is 10 parts per million. So they take it out of the ground at 14 parts per million, they treat it to get it below that, and so they get it down to around eight to six parts per million, but then just through what, what goes through your body and back into the wastewater system, it kicks it back above this 14 parts per million, and so they have to treat it below 10 parts per million again before they can land at it. So it's a very expensive system, and they've had continue um, to uh, have to update it. We are seeing some progress. There was a, a company out of, uh, they're outside of Boise, but they're using um, uh, settling ponds in long term. So they, they're using just biodiversity to take up nitrogen into like cattails and other products. Um, and, and they're using some grasses out of, I forget the actual grass they're using, but they're able to suck up the phosphorus and the nitrates at a high level and then remarket um, those products to something else. But there are ways we're looking at it, but it, right now to get nitrates and some of those things, it's quite expensive. And ambient concentrations are like one to two milligrams per liter PPM. Yep. So, you know, tens high. Yep. Any other questions? Yes. So the question was, um, Wendy previously mentioned that supporting politicians who are prioritizing water is really important in ensuring um, a resilient water future. And so the question was, if Wendy could specify um, what it would look like for a, a politician to be focusing on water and um, prioritizing water in a campaign or um, specific legislation, et cetera. Well, I mean, that's, that's a very big question. <laughs> but like I said, the, one of the first places to start is to understand really what the sustainable capacity of this mm -hmm. watershed is and, and start, start there. And then, you know, there's all sorts of places. Like we are not enforcing domestic water, um, ex exempt water, domestic exemption wells, you know, there's, people are overwatering or irrigating more acreage than they're allowed. The state's not enforcing that <clears throat> down to a certain point. We are continuing to build and annex and, you know, you know, one of the things that's happening repeatedly is you're taking surface water rights and getting annex into a city system, which is a straw in the aquifer that's available 24-7, mm -hmm. 365, where in, you know, under, a water, surface water regime, that water's available, you know, intermittently, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, a, it, it ha yeah, fluctuating, and, um, and so we're seeing all sorts of things that are marching along that, in, I mean, really it's the incremental change that nobody, nobody's really paying attention to, and it's going to blow up. That's, that's yeah. what I think. Um, I'm actually going to jump in. We had an audience member
Capri send in a question um, that kind of ties into something you just touched on. So I'm going to interject this question, and then we'll get back to live audience questions. Um, so this question is, is there a way to determine what the carrying capacity will be for our watershed in terms of delivering safe drinking water as well as agricultural needs? So I'm assuming this, this person is asking into the future. Is there a way to kind of predict that and measure for that? So we've been working, and we've been working with the uh, University of Boise for uh, several years now and to, to develop a um, uh, water model that we look at the, the holding capacity and, and the snow levels to get stream flow amounts and so we could do predictive um, cutoff dates for our ag community. So there are ways to do it um, and it can be done but then it's adhering to it but the, then you have to, it's just the luck of the job. Are we getting the storms in the right time of the year and the melt off? Is it going to be quick and fast or is it going to be a long slow spring so we can get more of that water back into the aquifer? So there's a lot of variables but there are tools and techniques out there to start a Addressing that, yes. Yeah, I mean, oh. yes, we do have we do have existing models, and none of this is rocket science. I mean, the, all the tools are out there to really start addressing this. It's really about politics mm -hmm. in the end. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to add. Um, you know, we do pretty well with land and water uh, levy board, but to kind of expand a little bit on politics. One thing we've discussed um, among the board members at times is that between the jurisdictions here in the valley, Ketchum Sun Valley, Hingley Valley in particular, um, you know, we can carry kind of off the for now because they do a little better down there. Um, there is no coordinated effort to inventory um, kind of our existing places where water can get into the aquifer, back in from, from snow mill, from rain, Whatever. So the more we develop um, annex, pave, compact the soil, the more we're putting essentially an umbrella on top of our aquifer and preventing recharge from happening. And, and that's going to become a big problem. So I think politically, one of the things we need to start looking at is how to show up at annexation meetings, write to your council, you know, city council, planning and zoning people, and show up or at least write comments on developments and annexation and really push, push hard for um, a water in for inventory and cumulative impact analysis on each proposed annexation and development. Because one might seem pretty small, it's only 10 houses over here, but that's going in with 10 here and 20 there and 80 over here. All of them seem to require pavement and sidewalks and blah, blah, blah. And all of it is systematically Pac-Manning over our catchment areas here on the valley floor. And so that aquifer, we're seeing real-time um, diminishment of you know, well, well water levels in the aquifer. People who you might know who have uh, domestic drinking water wells um, might be reporting them going dry and needing to drill deeper. And that's a very bad sign because at some point our groundwater aquifer intersects with the bottom of the riverbed. So if you want to keep a river flowing, you're going to keep, need to keep your aquifer somewhat filled. And so I think there are a lot of things we need to do to really be vocal and push hard that it is incumbent on our city planners and council people, um, planning and zoning, to fully understand the impacts of every development going in and how that impacts sustainability over the long term. This is pretty serious, and I, I think it's serious. I'm a little bit alarmist sounding. A little bit alarmed. Um, <laughs> to be honest with you, I find it alarming. Um, you know, so these are things that I think it's just—it's more important than now than ever to be loud about it and to show up. Because um, I learned a really neat term at a conference I went to um, last June. I'm, it's not mine. I'm not going to say I came up with this, but it was from a Navajo elder at a sustainability conference, and he said one of the big differences in um, kind of you know our uh, city white culture is that we teach and really um, really have pressure and, and teach rights and in mm -hmm. other cultures it's more about responsibility. Mm -hmm. So our private property rights in the state of Idaho in particular really slant heavily towards the right to develop no matter what. And that is not sustainable. So it's like we have to start looking at what is our responsibility and push our city and county leaders 
to enact policies to really understand the impacts and take action to, to, to mitigate it through development policy. Thank you. No, that was wonderful. Um, so for people watching at home, one moment, Brian, you've been so patient. Um, so for people watching at home or watching the recording later, um, we had an excellent comment, um, which was to kind of think about the um, and distinguish between rights in Idaho and responsibilities. And so what does it look like to be responsible for land and water and steward our ecosystem and environment? And then also to show up at um, planning, and zoning, planning and zoning committee meetings, um, think about annexation, and also um, be very vocal at city council meetings and let local politicians in our municipalities know that there are definitely costs to development and so how can we think about cumulative development in a more sustainable and resilient way. Um, Brian. Thank you and thanks to the panelists. Uh, I think Wendy you had mentioned the comments from both of you who were pertinent to this but taking a look at the watershed and looking at its sustainable water use. Um, this has to be a really complicated problem driven by a number of factors, but including the variability of precipitation. Mm -hmm. And so our observation, just as one plant, is we're seeing less total water. We're seeing it come with much greater standard, uh, 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 deviation in terms of time. Mm -hmm. It's coming by, by so less total water in the one inches a lesser percentage, percentage of it in the form of snow. Uh, it starts later, it ends earlier, it melts sooner, which means those water molecules may for somebody in Oregon mm -hmm. that's taking them out of the you know, snake uh, uh, Columbia system and watering crops, but they're you know, into another magic reservoir. And the variability of this, the predictability of this is low. And so I understand the concept that there's well, this is our system, and this is what the sustainable use is. But we don't have a lot of water storage, and we don't have any water storage to speak of that's at this level or above the habitation mm -hmm. here in Blaine County. You have to go to Magic Reservoir, and short of being able to pop back when there's actually water in that reservoir. What happens in those bad years? Isn't it true that what you have is you have a sustainable water use given the input into the system? given the water, you know, given the precipitation and everything else, and that number is highly variable year by year. How do you address that from a managerial, from a political, from a water management perspective? Because the water rights, you know, are clear. We may not like the water rights in Idaho, but the state river makes an adjudication, mm -hmm. and it's 275,000 pages. You know, it's not like California. It'll take $20 billion in 20 years to figure that, that nightmare out there. Right here, we know what what people have the rights to use, but we don't really know year to year what we've got. Could you comment on that? So, thank you. To repeat the question, um, Brian's question was about water um, source volatility, and so year to year precipitation can change wildly. The timing of precipitation can change season to season. And so while we can certainly um, change certain systems and have you know, certain laws and policies in place, how do we prepare for those volatilities and fluctuations in water supply? Right, and I didn't even address that, right? Like that's an added, and then you just stack climate change on top of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> more I'm making the point that we're not even doing the bare minimum of like trying to understand what do we really have as a resource and how are we gonna manage it sustainably, you know, and how are we going to make our policies, you know, fruitful policies to help do that. But, you know, I mean, to your point, maybe we may end up needing to change some of it. Like, you know, there's talk about um, recharge and there's talk about, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we end up with more storage. Maybe we end up, you know, and obviously snowpacks melting sooner and that mm -hmm. was a storage reservoir. So all those things are going to be in play, and it's it's doesn't look like it's getting better, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, 
so I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to that in the long term. I think we're, I think we need to start doing some proactive things now, though. Chris, anything to add to that? <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's, for what, what we have, I, there's, there's no way to uh, put in, I, th I think we could fix, uh, what is it, Little Fish Creek, we could improve that dam and we can get, that's going to affect 20 people, but it would also help further down on some, some, some additional waters. But to help those 20 farms at $10 billion to rebuild that dam or whatever it's going to cost, I don't know what the last estimate was. Who knows? Um, so it, it, it's trying to get that monetary number to what, how do you make a, how do you make a season of crops and, and get your lamb um, processed into California when you only have 15 inches of, of rain to work with this year? But next year you might have a bumper crop. And I mean, as a manager, I, 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 I don't even know how you do it year to year. Um, we look at crop rotations and changing our crops up to what's more. I mean, we're talking with some variable irrigation getting uh, wheat and barley down to 15 inches throughout the season, but what are you gonna do for your next crop? Because you just don't wanna go grain, grain, grain. You've gotta have some rotation in there. And you know, alfalfa, it makes us some money, but um, it is a high uh, intensive crop when it comes to water usage. But it also does put some uh, nutrients back in, so there's a beneficial use. So um, I think if I could really answer your question, I'd be working at the Water Resources Board at the top end, but uh, um, even them, I don't think they have the answers yet, but I mean, that's why we're getting together and um, working with them. I'll write your recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? I just have one more comment. Oh, I think we have one more question. Well, yeah, I just, it, it, probably more of a comment that was addressed in the last few questions, but with the climate models that are out there, mm -hmm. and like Brian said, it's anticipated that snowpack, which is continually going to decline, and here in Idaho, uh, we may not even have much of snowpack by 2050, 2080. And now we see it also, in, oh, just after COVID, we saw a 10% increase in population in our capital. Mm -hmm. So what type of plans are being made to address the issues? That's a very good question. So the question was, um, we have a diminishing snowpack, and that is the, those are the climate predictions really all over the world over the next um, you know, 30 to 50 years. And so um, we also, in our region, have a um, pretty exponentially growing population. And so the question was, what is, are there any plans being made to address that? Um, and I would think that the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially my point, right? Mm -hmm. That we need to, we really need to do, we need political action. Mm -hmm. You know, from my perspective with the city of Bellevue, um, we are on a non-metered system. We have about 80% of the meters in the ground, but we're not using them yet. Um, we need to get using those meters and start tracking people's water usage, do a, do a citywide water audit to see how much water we're actually using, look at our rights to our, our usage to our, to our rights, and then develop a plan of action of how many houses we can actually bring in, what, what type of growth models are we looking at, um, and actually use the numbers that we have um, to make us a sound decision instead of saying, eh, sure, um, we can take that next development, no problem. I mean, we need to actually look at this throughout the entire valley, mm -hmm. using our water audits, using our, our current sources, you know, how long until we have to drill another source? Or are we gonna have to convert one of the current um, irrigation wells into a, a drinking water source? And how much money is that gonna cost? Because um, we do have some good wells on, on some of these uh, um, annexations that we're looking at, but um, to get them to be a drinking water source, um, you know, how much money are we going to put into that? And who pays for it? Is it the city or is it the developer? So, Wendy, you had a comment? Well, I was just going to say, when I first moved to town, one of the remarkable things I learned was that the city of Cary, some of you have heard me say this, the city of Cary um, had on its books, in its subdivision codes, a requirement that if you're going to develop something, you need to bring water rights to the table to cover mm -hmm. the development. Mm -hmm. And that's because Carrie's a bunch of farmers and they mm -hmm. actually understand water and water rights. And then the rest of the cities here, which presumably have the tools to do this, nobody's ever even touched that. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Um, I'll take a, we'll take a couple more questions. So um, I think one of the issues here is connecting why I should say water mm -hmm. at this end of the valley mm -hmm. um, to save water for uh, Richfield because mm -hmm. we have issues in Richfield about treating water, right? So I think the county needs to do a better education of what, what does this mean, not only for what am I doing individually for the land, but why am I saving water and uh, let's say not growing grass in my yard or um, so it can get, go into the aquifer and explaining to your normal resident that's using a lot of water why we need to save water downstream is it for the fish mm -hmm. so it can so we can recycle it and put it back in the water for sportsmen to use or you're going to have to explain the other thing that i have a problem with with the first in time, first in rights, and also beneficial use. I think it's going to come down to that my ben best beneficial use for the, my, the water is so I can live and drink. Mm -hmm. And if it comes down to, I don't want to say this is a war between ranchers and growers, but I can sure see this happening in California where the agriculture end of it, they're cutting back because they, they don't have enough to grow. So that, and I, I'm, I'm on board with Wendy, is the county needs to collectively know, know understand how, how many gallons are really coming out mm -hmm. on for all the wells. And then from there, do some planning on what happens hardscape go in and we don't have enough s uh, seepage in the aquifer. So what I'm getting back to education, education, education on a quarterly basis every three months from the county and from the cities. If you're not getting something in the mail quarterly mm -hmm. from your cities about where your water is going and how you can conserve or not really doing the job. And the same with the, and, and with the, on the county level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my comment. Thank you for your comment. So that comment was about, um, in, in brief, um, that comment was about connecting the dots um, in water conservation and um, making sure that all of the stakeholders are aware of how their everyday actions kind of accumulate and make an impact on the county and also um, where our water is flowing so south of here, whether that's fishermen being concerned about in-stream flows um, and being able to continue to recreate or farmers being concerned about having enough water um, versus residents being, um, you know, invested in having enough water to live here. Um, and so I will say before I let our panelists um, speak more to this that um, Blaine County is working on this. So there has been um, a series of meetings over the last year, uh, 5B Climate Action Now, and uh, Wendy spoke to being on one of these um, smaller groups that makes up this big group earlier. Um, so I'll let, let you both speak a little bit more to how Blaine County is moving in this direction. Well, I was advocating for a water budget. That's one of the things I was advocating for. Mm -hmm. the, but there's a, you know, there's a lot of places that um, all of these communities can step up to the plate and make changes. And there's, so I think, I think that there's going to be good things that come mm -hmm. out of that um, effort, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. But I just wanted to make a comment about your point about, you know, why and what is my individual action. Um, mean and how does it matter and one of the things that popped into my head is that um, and this is in my book so and it's, is that NASA documented that there are then and this is from aerial imagery there are 40 million acres of irrigated turf grass in this country it's our largest crop largest irrigated crop so when you ask about like what does it matter that I have this tiny little postage stamp 
lawn. Well, it matters because we're not growing food on it. Like, why are we not doing victory gardens? We would have n food insecurity would go away. You know, a lot of our, you know, all, all the related problems would mm -hmm. would um, improve. So that's just one example of like the cumulative impact because that's the issue here. Mm -hmm. Uh, through our source water protection plans, um, we do get out in the, ki uh, the community and we do get out into the schools and stuff. Uh, one thing we do is do uh, edible aquifers for the young kids and educate them young and then they bring it home and say, Mom, Dad, we have to do this. Um, it puts a little bit more pressure on them, but even at a higher level with the uh, Soil Conservation District, um, we are trying to get water out in that name here in the next month. And um, we do have, uh, you know, every two years we try to put together workshops, whether it's soil health. Um, last couple have been, and we're doing another spring one just on water quality and water quantity um, technologies and um, you know, things that we're using to, to help improve um, our snowpack. And so we're trying to get out there. The county um, is being progressive with um, the 5 b can and um, the Land and Water Board. I've been advising on that. And um, there's some good stuff out there. But then that still has to be adopted a, at the county commissioner level, then at the individual. Uh, municipalities and there's going to be some more hard discussions even with all the work that's been, been put into that um, you know it, it all it's gonna there's gonna be additional discussions but we're trying to get the education out there um, you know, there are there are fairs around the state uh, Portneuf has an environmental fair that just really talks about the water usage and you know we probably do that um, here in Haley sometime and uh, do a countywide uh, just a, a water water education weekend and um, get 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 everybody out and involved so I'll take one more question if there is one more question. Yes? Um, mine is maybe more of a comment as well. Um, I've been working on a couple of projects that I think that others in the room might be interested in joining. Um, one is to grow um, white bark pine, which almost has been totally depleted in our area. And um, it's been depleted because of, of rust and bark beetles. And um, so I'm starting to grow white bark pine so that the Forest Service can plant those and the community can plant them at high um, elevations so that we save that uh, snowpack till later in the spring. And then the other uh, project that we've been working on with the um, Wood River Climate Action Group is developing a residential irrigation class through CSI. And if everyone could push on the counties and municipality planning offices, about five or six years ago, we tried to get everyone to uh, all of the municipalities and the county to um, create a landscaping um, approval mm -hmm. system. And um, because most of our irrigation people in this county have not been educated in proper in, um, irrigation practices, they learn in the field. And most of them are Spanish. They don't speak English well enough so that when there are classes for them to go to, they don't understand most of it. So our proposal is to have classes that the, the Spanish-speaking students can hear the translation mm -hmm. at the same time in the, the class and um, learn and, and understand better. Because there's math involved with friction and and uh, in order to make your um, irrigation be really effective and um, save water. Mm -hmm. So if everyone and but one of the problems is that nobody, none of the municipalities or the county, nobody um, polices it. And so you know even if um, even if people don't follow the rules or follow the regulations, um, nobody does anything about it. And so there are, there are two aspects to this. You need to have well-trained people so that they install 
good systems to begin with, and secondly, and also know how to maintain mm -hmm. them well. And we're going to do a testing, three-part testing series, so that these students can be um, certified. And if everyone would push to the county and the municipalities to only allow uh, irrigation landscaping people who are certified to install in the systems or even work on the systems, we have a lot better uh, mm -hmm. use of water in the residential areas. Yeah. So those are two, uh, two projects that you might want to think about. Yeah, thank you so much. So that comment was about um, the importance of repopulating white bark pine um, in our valley and also about the importance of making sure that we're giving everyone in our community the tools to learn more about what they can do, um, whether it's irrigation installment or another profession, um, what they can do in their day-to-day -day lives to, um, to contribute to water resiliency. And I think that that comment speaks to a theme that we've kind of um, coalesced at this evening, which is that um, we all have a role in encouraging policymakers to incentivize um, more cohesive and impactful um, water resiliency action. Um, and so it's really important to show up at your planning and zoning um, committee meetings. It's really important to write to your city councilman or have conversations with them when you see them at Atkinson's, um, if you know who they are. And it's also really important for us to collaborate and um, talk to each other because there are a lot of awesome people in this room who are doing really cool work. And so if we can communicate more um, and help each other out, that is a big part of it as well. Um, so we're going to wrap up here. I would like to extend some thank yous. So huge thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I would also like to say thank you to the rest of my SVI team that has supported this event and also to Haley Public Library for co-hosting this event and um, setting up this very tech-savvy setup for us to be able to um, live stream and also record this event for later viewing. Um, I also want to extend a big thank you to Luis Laconda for live translating this event. Um, and so something that we're working on is making sure that our educational events are accessible to everybody. Um, so if you know people who are only Spanish speaking who would like to attend our events in the future, it's something that we're hoping to continue to be able to offer. Um, so. Thank you all for being here as well and for your um, enthusiastic questions and um, caring about this topic. And um, we have a table in the back with some additional resources. So there are some QR codes for people to scan and also some examples of excellent books if you're interested in reading more about these topics. We also have near our sign-in sheet, um, we'll have a, an opportunity for you to share something that you've learned with us tonight um, because we like to look back and see what people have learned from our events. So thank you all again. Oh, and Kristen has something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the Haley Public Library did a four-part series in 2022 called Our Water. Um, one aspect of it was the aquifer, where it starts, where it ends, where it goes. Another part of it was um, looking at the intricacies of water law. And then another look at just the historical happenings in the Wood River Valley that led us to where we are now in terms of water. So that's all on our archives page. Um, just go to haleypubliclibrary.org. You know, library programs, look for the archives, and they're all right there. So yes. Oh. We are going to send an email out to anyone who registered for this event, or if you sign up on the sign-in um, email list, you'll get some resources. We'll include all four of the our water links will also include the reporting to this and some other materials that we've gathered as we research and educate ourselves for Hannah um, and our group to be able to host this. And if our presenters have anything, um, we have future events coming up. So if you sign up there, you'll receive that and also updates about future events to come. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> and, and write us your, your thoughts or what one your takeaways and you can put it in that jar and there's some little colored post-its. Do that. Yep. And um, Minot also brought some 
um, seeds that are water friendly, so more drought resistant seeds. So um, thank you so much for that addition. And those are also on the resource table in the back. Thank you. Thank you.